All right, guys, welcome back. Matt Barton here with part three of my interview with the great Trent Oster, uh, formerly of Bioware, now of Beamdog. In this section, we get into Baldur's Gate, uh, what it was like working on it back in the day, and also the uh, trials and tribulations they ran into with the enhanced editions. Uh, we talk about RPG stats and the role of luck, uh, different kinds of controller schemes, uh, the, who came up with the WASD, uh, keyboard configuration, and much, much more. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Trent Oster. Now, had you been playing some of those, like the Battletech games or the the tabletop yeah. mech stuff? I never, got, I never got huge into the tabletop stuff. There was the old um, MechWarrior RPG where you had an yeah. entire party and you ran around on PC. I played the heck out of that. I loved the giant robot thing. I loved, uh, there was a game that came out, Earth Siege, so we played that. Uh, there was a robot, it was like an arena fighting game. I forget what it was called. I, I don't know if it was a really, if it was a licensed Battletech game or not, but they did a really good job on the, the music. Like At that time, music was basically MIDI, and that was about all you could do, but they had MIDI, and it would fire sound loops, so it actually sounded pretty tight, so... We went with a similar system that could do that, and we were inspired by that. And and really, uh, when I look at Shattered Steel, the visuals came, a lot of it came from Doom. A lot of it was inspired by hmm. the, the the upfront, in-your-face nature of the, of the guns and, and how it kind of played. And I'm not sure, but I think, I think we're one of the first people who ever did WASD. Because... I remember trying to play it on the arrow keys, and that was how you played. That was how you played Doom at the time was on the arrow keys. Yeah. And I was like, why don't I just move it all, all the way over to the other side? Let's just do WASD. It'll work. So I don't know if I ripped that off from somewhere else, or if I'm, or if, if we're the first shooter style game to do that. Hmm. I, I think I maybe invented it, but I'm not sure. Well, it for sure wasn't Doom. I don't yeah, know somebody, what else would have. Somebody's going to come along and, and... Somebody out there will know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I remember the first time I had it over there and I was playing it, it felt it felt good. I didn't have to move my keyboard around. I didn't have to move my mouse. It just felt felt better. Yeah, I can remember I can remember doing that for the first time and trying to use the arrow keys and like, what? i got to go over here and WASD. What? This is crazy. You know? yeah. Maybe like two minutes later, why, why don't all games use WASD? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we ever use these arrow keys over here? Well, we used to play the heck out of like Especially at that with time. A mouse. Doom, I mean, that's what it comes yeah. down to, right? You can't use the mouse. Well, we we played the heck out of out of Doom, and then when Doom Two came out, our whole office we all had joysticks, so we were all playing with joysticks. And I heard this rumor about no, it's way better if you play it with a mouse, man. And so I was like, hmm. <laughs> so I jumped over. Everybody else in the office is still playing with the joysticks. I probably start playing mouse keyboard, and off the start, I suck. Because I'm just learning how to do it, but suddenly I'm I'm winning every game, and everybody's like, "What's going on?" Suddenly, Trent's kicking our butts. What's what's the thing? And it's the the infinite rotation rate that you can get with a mouse. Whereas with the the joystick, you turn, you can only turn at a specific rate. Where the mouse, as fast as you can whip it, it'll move. So you're like, Whoa! with the mouse, and your character spins that fast. So it's a huge advantage. So within about five days, everybody in the office had abandoned joysticks and was playing mouse keyboard. And then from there on, there was no discussion about, yeah, Shattered Seal's going to have mouse keyboard. It's going to be awesome. I don't want to jump ahead here too much, but now that you know we are talking about this, <laughs> you know, so I hear this all the time from people that prefer console games, right? They like the the game pads over their, uh, mm -hmm. you know, over the mouse and keyboard, and they feel a little weird about having to play these. Uh, games with a keyboard. I know you've been working on this very issue, right, with some of these games making console versions. So, you know, how's your thinking evolved on it? Just in terms of an in interface. Yeah, you really got to rethink the interface pretty hardcore. Like mouse keyboard, especially in a in a shooter environment, is such a huge advantage. I don't think there's any way to make it really fair, even if you cheated in like auto aiming. And for the Baldur's Gate stuff. It comes down to kind of what's your most common actions and how do you want to move through the world and interact with the world. Like in Baldur's Gate, you click on the ground, you, you drag select your party, mm -hmm. and that, that's where the party walks. On console, you drive a character and the rest of the party has to follow. So we actually wound up building this entire 
AI system that just works on party following and, and having the, the characters group around the player and not block the player and not collide with the player. It was months and months of work to kind of rebuild the whole PC pathfinding system because Baldur's Gate, I mean, for its era, it's amazing. But when you look at what it's actually doing, it's it's all fakery on a little 2D bitmap. And the 2D bitmap is ridiculously low resolution. So, like, if you can walk down a hallway, it's got to be at least one pixel wide. So the, the Ulcaster runes are a great example. They're one pixel wide. So they're a pain in the butt to navigate. And party members can't go past each other. It's just a nightmare. So we had to go in and literally kind of bump up some of those maps, make them almost two pixels wide in some places. In some places, change the math on how it actually calculated what it was. Some ways, actually throw out the whole blocking of party members and let them kind of bump past each other. So it was really like tearing everything apart and kind of reimagining it. So the console stuff has been a ton of work, but I think the vindication came like we were at PAX East in Boston. We were demoing it and people would come up and once they they started running the characters around. They were just having a great time, even just running the player around and having the party follow. And watching, standing back and watching somebody play your game, it's it's a terrifying, but it's an amazing experience at the same time. Because you can see the joy. You can see where they're enjoying it and having fun with it. And then you can see the moments when they stumble into something. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, God, they did the thing. Oh, no, not, not that thing. <laughs> oh, damn, we got to be – how do we fix that? How do we fix that? So you go back to the studio and you're like, yeah, I saw them do this and this again and again. How do we fix that? And so it leads into big meetings and a lot of brainstorming. And hopefully you're, you're always kind of marching it forward and making it better. Yeah, I think sometimes our nostalgia sort of – changes up the way things were controlled or something like i know this this kind of become a meme now like it's a great thing this whole you must gather your party before venturing forth everybody loves that but i remember back in the day i did not love that that was like really <laughs> annoying because one of your guys is like stuck on a, a a barrel or something way back at the start of the dungeon and i'm like i don't know if yeah. you really remember this the way <laughs> accurately you know there's like a cloud of <laughs> yeah, and then you've got to go back and you've got to find that character and then you've got to navigate them by hand to catch up to the rest of your party and hopefully they don't run into anything on the way there and get murdered. Yeah, but, hopefully, uh, that would be bad. <laughs> that was actually one of the things we fixed up with the enhanced editions is we actually went through and kind of fixed up a lot of the core pathfinding behavior so the party would stick together better and people were like, yeah, it's great. It's just like I remember it. It's like, no, it's actually a lot <laughs> better, better than you remember it. <laughs> you just don't notice that. Well, that's, I think that's probably a good goal to have, right? If people think that they remember it being that good, and yeah, don't need to be. Well, it, it's hilarious because whenever I see screenshots of in, of Baldur's Gate, it's like and Baldur's Gate. It's always the enhanced edition stuff, and it's like 4K, and everybody's like, "Yeah, that's what the game looked like." I was like, "No, the game was like 640, 480, mm-hmm. and and a good two thirds of the screen was like gray stone, so you had this little window that you played in." Yeah, I remember it's thinking that too with a lot of the. Because I got this big widescreen monitor and everything. Once you see it in the big widescreen, you're like, man, how in the heck? Was it, it just feels like you're, it almost feels claustrophobic playing it in the original resolution. So. Oh, yeah. Well, like the original, the, the screen size was limited by performance. We actually wound up slowly shrinking the screen size until the game actually ran half decent. And then we're like, okay, now we know how big we got to build the UI. And those postage, remember those games, the little postage stamp size video clips? <laughs> thought that yeah. was, that's so awesome! <laughs> exactly. We were so easily satisfied back oh. then. And so much of the game ran in your imagination, and when the team actually visualized something for you, you were like, that's amazing! Yeah, I got a question here from a drunken retro. that I'll throw this in quick. Should be, should be interesting. Uh, so Drunken Retros asks, uh, will the upcoming D&D console ports have co-op? And if so, how will it be handled? So for the Baldur's Gate series, we're going to launch without it, and we're going to patch it in afterward. We just found, like, going to the consoles, the big challenge being, like, Xbox, PlayStation, and, and Nintendo all have very different multiplayer platforms. And just the work in getting each of those platforms stood up. So the plan is, yes... We're going to have it in the games that, that featured it, but we're not going to be able to add it into like Planescape Torment because Planescape is its own unique beast yeah. and trying to make that multiplayer. I can't just... imagine what that would be like. That just it, it would not work. It would just yeah. blow up. 
you'd be doing some plot thing and somebody would run over and talk to somebody and the entire thing would just be broken and you'd be like we can't make any progress what's going on oh bob talk to the guy oh man what do we do and the instead of being the nameless over. one i guess you have to be Ooh. like the nameless two and three <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh that'd be messy yeah i was uh, somebody that uh the skybound collector's editions you know i guess the pre-sales are done for that I, i'm trying to order the ultimate a collector's kit, or I forget the exact terminology. Maybe yeah. I should. <laughs> you know, get, I want to get the name of it right. Uh, but do you have a sense of when those might be available just for regular order? I think they're planning on, on uh, having them for regular order right around launch period. So I think later on this year. I'm not sure exactly if they've communicated the, the actual launch dates yet. So, But when it comes available, those those will be out. Um, I've seen the the Beholder Dice Bowl. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I just I've got to get it. There's <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun. my fear because... is that they're going to sell out or some nonsense, and I won't get I would... my. Uh, it was it was it's been great working with the Skybound people because they're really enthusiastic. Oh, yeah, they're fantastic. And when we started talking about collectors editions, they're like, "Oh, we can do everything," and we're like, "Everything's going to cost a lot of money." And they're like, "It's okay. It'll be awesome." So we're like, "What do we want to do?" What would we do if we were totally nuts? And we did most of what we just what we had chatted about. So it was a lot of fun. Well, I thought that was it the Siege of Dragon Sphere that has the coin, uh, the Baldur's Gate. I don't know if that's that's probably. Yep. That had anything yeah, to do with Skybound. I don't know, but there's a coin. No, that was that was uh, one we did by ourselves. So we sat down with Siege of Dragon Sphere, and it was kind of like, let's make a really good collector's version. So let's let's make the coin. Let's let's do a little a little necklace. Let's do the the map. Oh, let's do this thing. It weighs like a ton. <laughs> I know. So it's, my thing is, I obsess about a few things. One of them is, I want something on my shelf that looks awesome. Look at and that's really where boy. the box. I, I know. Yeah, this would give nice, this would give Lord British envy here. It's actually a pretty decent sized map, and uh, it's heavy we, duty we too. Through, like, man. Yeah, we wanted it to stand up, and we, we wanted it to kind of have that, that parchment look without kind of being as fragile as parchment actually would be. Spiral bound. Yeah, that was a, that was a oh, huge man. Baldur's Gate. I just want to cry when I see, bound. like, a spiral bound manual. <laughs> uh, it's just such a beautiful thing. I feel like we – I feel so sorry for the younger generation sometimes. They don't – you know, this was just the norm back back when we yeah. were kids, and now it's – oh, no, you have – it's like the super collectible – I, I just remember, I think it was Ultima, I think it was Ultima 3. I remember opening the box and reading through the spell book and reading through the, the player's manual. And I, I, could, I wasn't able to play the game yet. I forget what was going on. Like, I don't think we had enough RAM in the PC at home or something. So I was just reading the spell book or actually it would have been an Apple at that point. And uh, I'm reading through it, reading through it. I, I literally went through everything in the box for two or three days before I could actually start playing the game, and I just loved it. And that was my exact experience with the Pool of Radiance, uh, the old SSI game. I'm sure you know what yep. I'm talking about. I was, I think it was maybe yep. birthday or Christmas or something, and I convinced uh, – my grandmother was the one that bought me all of these. You know, so I okay. convinced her that this game is going to be so complicated. I need to have the manual so I can be ready. <laughs> like on day one, that's she's awesome. So, somehow talked her into that, and good God, that was just. You know, on the one hand, I just could not wait, but on the other hand, it was like the pain, <laughs> yeah. the anticipation and the oh. torture all mingled. <laughs> yeah, those are great. Those, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I think is it called the ultimate? Is the one that has everything? I remember. I don't know what the official name what we finally Ultimate agreed on because there was about five duper. of them. <laughs> yeah. But Ultimate Collector's Edition was kind of the that was the concept. That was what we what we discussed as to what exactly it's called. I'm not totally sure at the moment. Yeah. Look, I, I like the idea. I love this. You know, back when we were kids, you just had to scrape up every penny just to get into the game at all. Now we're like, yeah, I can get the Ultimate Collector <laughs> Super Edition leather bound. <laughs> Well, and, and the fun thing is that this is this is something that you remember from your childhood, so it's got this whole nostalgia angle. Oh, yeah. But now you're able to roll in and, and do it at that at that kind of collector's edition level, and it's got all those all those little things that you remember so fondly. 
Let me. And I gotta get this it, coin. Hold on one second. Sure. Yeah. So look at this thing. That that is a hefty coin. I mean, I remember seeing this. You know, it'd come up on the little screen and like, man, that'd be awesome to have that. <laughs> and here it is. Whoa. The first. This first is the baddest that... ass looking coin I've ever seen. The first lot of those coins that hit the office, for a while, I was like Two-Face. <laughs> Everywhere I walked, I had the coin, and I was flipping yeah. it and playing with it. <laughs> there was a lot of coin flipping in the office for quite a while. <laughs> really heavy duty. I mean, it's really worth getting if yeah. if you like coins at all. I mean, wow. Yeah, like a, I could imagine you like a big bucket of these things. Like, <laughs> we, 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 like Scrooge uh, McDuck or something with the boulders. Well, game. when we... When we made the Caesar Dragon Spear Collector's Edition, we made 3,000 copies of it. And initial pre-sales knocked off, I think, about 1,600 of those. And then over the years, we've sold down, I think we've got about 500 left. And we're kind of like, we've got our press stash that we keep, and then we've got ones that we're selling off. So we're almost out of them. And uh, one of the neat things that I don't think we talked enough about is that each one has a card in it. And the card has the number. So of 3,000 that were made, it'll tell you the, the number of, of the 3,000. Is that in the kit somewhere? Yeah, it's right in the kit. It's the, the card that has the steam. Or not the steam code, but it's, it's the little card. I don't know where that... Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, so I'm glad you told you. me about that. I might have just chucked this now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Limited Collector's Edition number 960. So you are 960 of 3,000. There will never be a 3001. No, I didn't even notice that. It's got a cool back on the card, too. Yeah, I'm still finding things out about this collector's edition I didn't even notice before. It, it's a pretty cherry collector's edition. We put oh. a lot of work into it, and it took a long time for us to do it. It was our first, first time ever doing anything collector. And in retrospect, I'm really happy with how it turned out, but the journey to get there was long yeah. and tortuous. Yeah, just to show you some comparisons, right? So this is the Baldur's Gate coin. This is the Tabula Rasa uh, coin. So I think you can see. <laughs> I won't say anything, but, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're compensating for something there. <laughs> we must have the biggest coin. We must have the biggest terrify. coin, the biggest map. I don't know. I guess Shroud of the coins Avatar. coins must be scared. I don't even know if I've taken my Shroud of the Avatar out of the... I think it's still in the plastic back there. I wonder if he's got a coin... I, I don't know. I, never I don't got think a that's like on. super duper collectible. I miss Lord <laughs> British. She's probably got like a suit of armor or something. With <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that at one point. Let's let's make the ultimate Baldur's Gate edition. We'll make the Saravok armor suit. Yeah, we'll I had like Brent, when I had Brent stick. on, we were talking about, you know, he's like, well, you know, Trent does weapons, so you can have like a, a sword <laughs> or a knife. Like yes, we, yes. We talked about that. And like, what if someone kills somebody with the collector's edition sword? That would be bad. Aww. Well, okay, let's let's not do the sword. Okay, what can we do? What if it didn't have an edge on it, just like a a decorative I think, item? I think even a decorative item is pretty much a big metal <laughs> war club. Whack. <laughs> exactly. Two-handed sword doesn't really have to be sharp to do very, a lot of damage to somebody. Yeah, it would give a whole... It would give uh, poor uh, gasoline on the fire, that violence in video <laughs> games debate, right? If you're shipping actual <laughs> weapons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's keep that under under control for now. Yeah. Like, I do the weaponsmith thing for me. That's fun. And I enjoy it. And the video game stuff with two separate things. Yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, let's get back to uh, Baldur's Gate a little bit more, because uh, I just sure. found all these great quotes from you in various interviews and, and tweets and things. And, oh, God. You know, one of them was, we were just kind of chatting on t Twitter, and you had, you, tweet, you tweeted a response, and we were talking, we had this crazy discussion going on about stats and so many different ways to talk about strength, dexterity, and blah, blah, blah. But somehow the subject of uh, a luck, a stat for luck, came up and then you chimed in and informed us uh, that Baldur's Gate has a buried luck stat. And apparently it was, quote, a pain in the butt <laughs> and quite inconsistent in implementation. 
That, that sounds like what's that's I quite the say. reveal there. So, so the, the the problem with luck is it should affect almost everything. It should affect to hit rolls. It should affect saves versus versus death or or anything like that. It should affect the outcomes of so many different things. But when you're looking at the code paths that everything can go through and trying to essentially build a numerically stable system, adding in luck to everything would just be horribly complicated. So that luck in Baldur's Gate is very selective with how it's kind of implemented. So occasionally it will it will affect a it, it can affect a conversation if somebody coded in specifically for it to affect that conversation. It can affect other things provided somebody went through and created that code path. But it, there's so many code paths that the game can run through that that it's it's almost not possible to cover every possibility of luck. So I think at the time it was about the best implementation you could do. And looking back on it, I'm like I'm surprised we even attempted something like that. It's really weird as to think about it as a stat. Yeah. You know, because strength you you work out you get stronger. Mm -hmm. But luck, I mean, how do you really? Get luckier. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> Everybody points to Domino, the the comic book character. Yeah. Her special power is that she's incredibly lucky. Just good things happen for her and, and bad things don't. And and like you said, there's no way to, to to really develop that. You're either lucky or you're not lucky. And it's it's just kind of random. And it, like luck plus one, what is that what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. It means that okay, outcomes are gonna be a little bit better. And in, in the D and D like D twenty, one stat is basically five percent. So you're five percent more likely to have a positive outcome in any given scenario than anybody else. So if you had luck plus five, you would just win everything. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, ah, I just I make the save. Uh, my hit rolls are twenty five. <laughs> everything just gets the, so good. In the fifth edition, there's a luck, lucky feat. I think. Okay. Is that how they done that, and you get to re-roll. Sometimes I think, I think I think the advantage and the, the the luck concepts, the way they've done it in fifth is actually really intelligent. Like that idea of having that second roll and taking the best of the two, mm -hmm. or like disadvantage where you roll two and you take the worst. It's just a nice way to keep the random nature of it, but at the same time allow for that kind of better or worse outcome. It's a good solution. It's 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 not obvious, and but once you see it, you're like, oh, that's that's a that's brilliant. I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> no, so when I had the same thought, I wonder if there's some way to game it. There's a way to game everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a question of, of how to do it. You take your that that feed and then you, you stack it with this and you bring something yeah. else in and then you get Oh, there's there's so many parameters on it. I'm sure out there somewhere on the internet there's like this ultimate Cheeto build. <laughs> the like, Cheeto build. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is the luck monster build. You do this and this and this and this and then you roll like the dice ten times and you take the best roll. I mean part of me is just it's luck, right? You're kind of yeah. lucky yourself as the player. You roll a twenty. You got yeah. lucky, right? Maybe it's something that the player has as opposed to what a character would have, but I don't know. It's just really weird to me. The more I think about it, my brain just turns to mush, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just look at it Who am the, I? What, what reality is this? <laughs> I look at it from the numerical stability side, and I'm like, we've just thrown in a factor that we don't define crystal clear how it applies in every scenario. Mm -hmm. Because of that, its ability to make something radically destabilized is really high. So just back away in fear and do nothing. <laughs> Uh, here's something that I thought was fun about the uh, enhanced edition uh, of the game, 2013. Uh, so you were talking about, I think this was an interview on maybe Gamma Sutra. I always tell myself I'm going to write down the source of all these quotes and then always forget. I guess my luck stat is low. Uh, <laughs> but you were talking about the Infinity Engine, and this I thought was really interesting. So the Infinity Engine was multi-threaded before there were processors capable of parallel code execution. As such, it was designed around a concept of threading that never really emerged. Main issue was all the threads shared the same set of data. The problem is all these threads were created and they all hit the same memory and as such blocked each other, stalling all threads until the corrupt or until the current one completed. That just sounds like <laughs> what a mess. I, 
Well, well, from a programming standpoint, it sounded like a really elegant solution. It's like, okay, I've got this character who wants to do a pathfinding request. Oh, and I've got this character who wants to do a pathfinding request, and I've got 40 or 50 characters that all want to do these requests. Well, I'll just make them kick off a new thread. It'll be great. It'll be this elegant mm -hmm. solution. The problem became when you looked at it, it's like, okay, that guy kicks off his pathfind. He demands the pathfinding information so that he can do his pathfind. And he locks that data while he's looking at it. But meanwhile, there's another thread kicked up that's trying to look at the exact same data. The data's locked. It can't access it because the, the first one could actually be changing that pathfinding data by moving the character in that space. So you've got all these, all these things that from one perspective, from a code perspective, it seems like an elegant solution. But from a, what the actual hardware is doing is mm -hmm. just a bloody nightmare. And you're like, oh, my God, this is so wrong. Yeah, situations like that, I think, would be really where you'd want somebody like you that understands the hardware side as well as the abstract stuff. And, and at, the, at the time, I mean, multi-threading was just so new as a concept because, I mean, I had come up 16 It's still kind of murky to me. I, <laughs> I understand it better now, but at the same time, I'm still like, I inherently distrust it because it's like, and here's where the magic happens. Anytime the magic happens, mm -hmm. things can go wrong. When they're radically disparate tasks that are doing very different things and, and playing with totally different pieces of data, it makes a ton of sense. But when they're, when they're tightly linked and they're crashing into each other, you start to get pipeline stalls and, and things just hang up. And you can get just kind of unpredictable behavior occasionally. Like that was one of the problems with Baldur's Gate. Like, when we got the code originally to do the enhanced editions, we ran it, and it was running really slow. And we're like, why is it slow on its amazing computer? Mm -hmm. And we started digging in on the analytics, and we're like, it's spending 80% of the time stalled. Well, one thing is doing one piece yeah. of one person's doing a path find. Well, the others are actually asking for it, and it's it's actually way more overhead with all the other threads trying to access that piece of data, fighting for it with the one who's got it kind of locked down. So my business partner, Cameron, was like, hey, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to go in. I'm going to fix the threading. It'll be quick. I'll ninja in. I'll ninja out. Mm. Nobody will know I was there. And then he's like, <laughs> two weeks later, he's like, I just deleted like 300,000 words of code. And I'm like, dude, ninjas don't delete that much code. And he's like, trust me. It's better this way. And uh, what we did was we actually took a multi-threaded app and made it single-threaded again. And performance went way up, stability wow. went way up, and everything just got better. And it was like, yeah, simple's good. Simple yeah. we can count on. You have to thank, thank, uh, thanks for that. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back in a couple weeks to finish up this interview with Mr. Trent Oster. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. And as always, I want to thank you, uh, yes, you in particular, and uh, yeah, uh, for your support of the show, keeping these episodes coming, keeping Matt Chat alive after all these years. Could not, would not do it without you. So thank you for that. I am eternally grateful from the lowest dungeon of my heart. Uh, so if you want to support the show, haven't done so already, my God, what are you waiting for? Uh, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. It's a wonderful site. Uh, you can also go to mattchat.us if you prefer PayPal subscriptions. Uh, uh, but anyway, whatever you do to support the show, just know that I appreciate it and thank you. All right, so what about the news from the Matt Cave? got a lot of news from the old man cave. First up, the creators of Shadowgate, Dave Marsh, who I interviewed back in 2012, are, is out with a new game called Argonos and the Gods of Stone. This is a epic, an epic first-person adventure set in ancient Greece. Stranded on an uncharted isle, you must use your wits to unlock legendary mysteries, barter with the gods, and overcome an evil that threatens to bring the world to ruin. Now, this will be out October 8th. And they sent me probably the most awesome promo materials I've ever seen. It kind of this nice little printed uh, card, but if you get inside here, 
they have supplied me with yet another awesome collectible coin. <laughs> it even comes with a, a little stand uh, for the coin. So I just had to show you guys this. This is just awesome. I mean, it's a wonderful design on this coin. I don't know if, what you have to do to get one of these if you're, if you're not a personal friend, I guess, of Dave Marsh. But it's got the Trident on there. I think this might even be heavier than the famous uh, <laughs> Siege of Dragon Spear coin. Looking around for that, I don't guess I had that uh, that coin handy. Uh, too bad. I'd like to compare them, but this is—I mean, this is a great design. You just look at that. You know, I love these coins. They—they really know me well. <laughs> so, Dave, if you're watching this, you know, thank you so much for this. This is awesome. I'm definitely going to put this up somewhere uh, in a place of honor uh, here on the map shelf. Uh, I hope I didn't show you the steam key. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, check that out. Argonus, looking good. Maybe I'll get Dave back on to talk about it. Uh, BBC Future wrote about this. This is the mysterious origins of an uncrackable video game. Uh, so this is about the video game archaeologists. They're diving into these old, uh, obscure games, looking for secrets almost, like uh, little tips and tricks, uh, techniques that might prove useful for the future games. Uh, not just uh, you know, not just for history's sake, but like how how might we what lessons could we learn from the past? A lot of the stuff will be forgotten or has been forgotten. These guys are delving into it. Uh, one John Acock, uh, the University of Calgary in Alberta, he's got a cool quote here. Um, uh, so basically, they, they were looking at this game called Entombed, and it generates a maze, but nobody's really sure like how do they do this? How do they generate this maze? It comes out perfect every time. Uh, they've been trying to reverse engineer it, I guess. No real luck. It just seems to be mysterious. <laughs> you know, it's kind of got that uh, lure to it. Uh, anyway, I Icock says, The struggle I have as a scientist is, I think that there should be some logical way that this will all make sense, and there really doesn't seem to be. It's almost like magic. And so that's pretty cool. So thanks uh, for, to uh, Matt Workala for that uh, link. And also up, uh, this is Stargate's Tabletop RPG. They're looking for playtesters on this. I didn't even know there was a, Star, a Stargate uh, Tabletop RPG in the works. I guess I would have assumed that would be uh, that would long ago have been created. Uh, but it looks like this is a, a new project it's by Wyvern Gaming. Really awesome little Stargate model that goes with this, looks like. Uh, so they, uh, they got this sci-fi tabletop game where you assume the role of a member of Stargate Command on a Stargate team. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Perfect uh, scenario, I think. Uh, as an SG team member, you and your teammates will go on Stargate missions guided by missions commander in the fight against the Ghoul. Rules are currently in development and based on the 5th edition open gaming license. Joining up makes you the first to hear ap about upcoming public preview events, Kickstarter launch, and other stuff. So, I'm a, you know, I didn't watch Stargate back in the day when it was out. Just not really on my radar for whatever reason. Uh, so I've been going back. Uh, it's, it's all on Amazon Prime. So I've been catching up, and it's really a wonderful series. <laughs> Just having a really great time, old Richard Dean Anderson there. Uh, so this really caught my eye. I'm really excited about this. A tabletop RPG, and who knows, maybe they'll turn this into a, a computer RPG as well. Uh, and then one last item, uh, good old David Beatty, interviewed him back in 2017. You know, I've been doing this for a while. You don't know, realize that I interviewed Dave Marsh, you know, this guy, that was back in 2012. <laughs> you know, time is passing, folks. Uh, you know, for what that's worth. Uh, but anyway, David Beatty uh, wrote in about his uh, project, uh, formerly known as Mega Wars, now Galactic. Galaxicus, G-A-L-A-X-I-C-U-S, Galaxicus. Uh, he says they will be supporting Linux <laughs> and Mac uh, in early access. And if you don't know about Galaxicus, just go back and watch those interviews. Uh, or I can just sum it up here. You can look at it on Steam. Uh, the Galaxicus MMO, equal parts space exploration, space combat, and planetary and empire building. And the twist is the whole universe resets every four weeks. So... Uh, David and I talked about that extensively back in that, that interview series. But it's a pretty good idea uh, for people that don't want to feel like they're way behind or they have to keep logging in every week or something. If you just want to, you know, if you kind of want a level playing field and you don't want to get into it, you know, just wait a few weeks and everything's back and everybody will be on the same level. So it's a pretty cool system. All right. Whew, I think that'll do it for the news. 
Now let's wrap up with a quote then. And I found a great quotation here. I want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, so this is, the quote is from, um, let's see, what's the guy's name? Alan J. Perlis. Uh, so he's an American computer scientist, professor at Purdue University, best known for his pioneering work in programming languages and the first recipient of the Turing Award. As I was looking for quotes about programming, I came across this guy. I didn't really recognize the name, but, you know, the more I read about him, I'm like, man, that's a pretty cool dude. <laughs> and the quote's good, too. Man. It goes something like this. There are two ways to write error-free programs. Only the third one works. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys enjoy that, and see you next time. Is that you? Here's a hint.